Okay, so here's what we're going to do. If you have our app, you can grab our notes in there. Um, at the end of the notes in there, you'll see a link to download a PDF file. So um, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, which we're not live, so y'all don't get nervous, but if you're watching this on YouTube, um, if you look in the description below, there'll be links to different things. One of the, those will be a link to the study notes, so you can get a PDF and have a hard copy or electronic copy, whichever. Um, okay, so last week we covered the whole story of the Bible, right? And, and like an hour and 20-something minutes. So um, hopefully it won't be that long tonight. Um, that'll kind of depend on you. What I want to do is I'm going to take you through a couple things. We're going to look at a couple verses from Genesis. Um, but I want to encourage you to ask questions. Stop and let's discuss it if, if something's not clear. Um, all that's okay. So here's what I'm going to do starting out of the gate. Let's go a little bit of review. Just kind of get the whole Bible story back in our head. Um, I'm not going to tell the whole thing that I did last week. We're going to skip a few things. But this will kind of give us a a worldview, so to speak, of what the Bible is speaking to, okay? So last week we talked about Genesis 1 and 2 is describing heaven and earth, and the garden is kind of an overlap, that the Garden of Eden is a place where heaven and earth are one. So you might think of it as kind of a temple-like place. So this is a place where God's presence is, uh, humanity is there, and he's able to walk in the garden with humans, right? All on the same page there? So the way, that the, the way that these diagrams help us to think about that is that overlap. So at one time, there was a space where God could be on earth with humans. God's spirit could walk with them in the garden. Things were awesome, right? Did it stay that way? No, right? So in Genesis 3... Um, we have what we commonly call the fall. I like to call it the fail, F-A-I-L, the fail. And that'll make more sense as we get into that story later. Um, so if we think of the, we really need to think of this as an exile motive. So uh, this theme's going to come up over and over again, especially in the Old Testament, that you're going to be able to be with God, but if you don't, live the way he's called you to live, if you turn against him, if you go after other gods, whatever, then he would allow them to be exiled. So they would be driven out or taken out uh, to another place. So we think of Genesis 3, that's starting up that idea that when we turn against God and we define good and evil in our own terms instead of listening to God, um, exile is what comes out of that. So we can kind of think of this diagram. Now it's not totally separate. If you'll notice, there's still a little bit of overlap in the middle. God hasn't given up. He's still involved in creation. What happens, think about this, in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve take the fruit, what, what does God do? Does he run off and never come back? He, he goes to the humans, and he wants to have a conversation about it, right? So he's, he's not totally given up on this thing. He's not given up at all. But there are consequences to turning against God, as we all know, right? So the, the exile theme kind of gets set up all the way in Genesis 3. Now, if we fast forward in the story, especially when we get into Exodus, we find out that there's this idea of a tabernacle. God tells Moses, I want you to build this tabernacle. It's kind of a tent type thing. And that's going to function like the Garden of Eden did. It's going to be a heaven and earth spot because God's presence is going to dwell there, and humans can come and worship him. And, and so that, that becomes um, a heaven and earth place. So it's kind of like the Garden of Eden. And last week we talked about how if you look at the floor plan of the tabernacle or the temple, uh, there was this three-tiered, uh, three levels uh, going in. So pretty much anybody could go in one level, and then it was only the a certain people in the next level, only the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. So when you're reading those stories about the tabernacle or the temple, you're supposed to be thinking of those places like this is like a mini Garden of Eden spot where heaven and earth overlap, where heaven comes to earth. Make sense? Okay. So how did that go? Did that work out? The Israelites didn't keep their end of the deal, right? They kept 
breaking God's laws. Uh, most importantly, though, we don't see serious consequences or exile for God's people until they start worshiping other gods. So you'll re- if you read through the Old Testament, um, the Israelites, you, when you read that story, you're kind of like, these people were the dumbest people in the world. <laughs> like They had God with them this whole time, and they just kept turning away. But don't be too harsh on them, because aren't we kind of like the Israelites? Yeah, so one of the things that they did is they would set up idols of other gods in the temple. <laughs> and that was a big problem. That's when things got really bad for them. So the temple was a good plan. Only problem is humans. <laughs> remember, remember from last week, every part of the story, it's like God's trying to get back with his humans, and who messes it up? The humans, right. So in this story, same thing. They don't treat it right. They, they do good for a while, and then they don't, and it's over, over and over again. So fast forward into the New Testament. Jesus comes on the scene claiming to be a temple. In John chapter 2, he stands up in the temple and declares with all the religious leaders and God and everybody listening, and he says, tear this temple down, and in three days I will raise it up again. And everybody there thought he was talking about the building, the temple building. And they said, oh, it took 40 years to build this. What are you talking about? And John, the writer of the Gospel of John, kind of whispers to you and says, they didn't understand he was talking about himself. So he comes on, Jesus comes on the scene and says, hey, heaven's come to earth. I'm kind of like a temple. I am heaven on earth. And if you tear this down, I will raise it up again. He was talking about us. He's going to raise his body up again. He's going to send the spirit into our bodies. And then that means, who's the temple? We are. So now we're like little Garden of Eden temples all over the earth. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, and we hadn't got this far in the story yet and as far as going through the verses, but when he creates humans, he tells them to do what? Have a great time. Make babies spread everywhere, right? Be fruitful and multiply. So if you fast forward, and if we're supposed to be what Adam and Eve were intended to be, We're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Now, that can mean literally, (laughs) and it can mean we're supposed to spread the kingdom all over the the earth. So wherever we go, we're trying to take heaven and the kingdom with us and spread it. We're trying to make disciples. That's the mission, right, to make disciples. So we're doing the same mission. God's still trying to do the same mission he started in Genesis. We're all on the same page, okay? So that's where we're at now. Eventually, at some point in the future, we do not know when. Anybody that you see on TV or the Internet that says they know when this is going to happen, they're lying to you. They don't know, okay? But eventually, the heaven and earth is going to become one, and we're going to be in a new heaven and earth. So, uh, And God's going to be the temple there. There won't be a physical temple. We will be with God, and as far as we know, it'll be like that for all of eternity. Sounds good, doesn't it? And if you read Revelation where the new heaven and new earth is uh, described, what do you find there? You find a tree of life with rivers coming out of it, producing fruit all the time. So we're back in the garden. So the big story of the Bible is from garden to garden. Okay, so now you may have grown up thinking that the point of the Bible is to get you to heaven. Is that the point of the Bible? No. The point of the Bible is to get here. Now, you you may die and go to heaven in the meantime, but that's not the end. Heaven is not where we spend eternity. We spend eternity in a new heavens and new earth, a new heaven and earth spot that is described as a new earth. Okay, so make sense? We're all kind of on the same page. And if you if you're like, wow, that... That was a lot in a little bit of time. You should have been here last week. (laughs) Um, And you can watch it online and and get caught up. So what's the point of the Bible story? The point point of the Bible story is God wants to be with humans, right? And he refuses to give up on that. Because if you read the whole story, 
we keep messing that up. We keep failing to attain his presence because we keep running away from him. And what does he keep doing? He keeps running us down. And that's basically the story of your life, isn't it? We run away from him for a while, he comes and gets us. We run away again, he comes and gets us. Why? Because he's not going to give up on this. So the big question is, what does God want? You and me. That's what he wants. He wants to be with us. Um, Okay, so we can kind of shift gears here now that we've got that picture in our head. That's the overall story. Um. We, we need to learn in reading, especially the Old Testament, we need to learn to follow what we call patterns in the Bible. Now, if you go on the Bible Project uh, website and watch some of their videos, you may hear them talk about design patterns. And what, that, what they mean by that is, this is a biblical scholar term, um, the authors designed the Old Testament in certain ways. It's a Jewish way of writing. Uh, where they would use the same word or the same phrase in different stories in a certain book or in multiple books. And they do it that way because when you're reading through the story, it's supposed to call something to your mind that you read before, and you go back and read that previous story. I'm going to show you how to do this, okay? We're we're going to start tonight a little bit of that, um, and I'm going to show you how to mark these things in your Bible so that when you're reading along, that phrase will just jump off the page at you, and you'll go, wait a minute, I remember that from Genesis 3. And what you're supposed to do is go back and read Genesis 3 again, and it provides some insight. So it's all interconnected. So think of it this way. When we think about patterns, when you get on a website, and you're scrolling through a website, and you see a hyperlink. You all know what a hyperlink is? It's kind of highlighted blue and underlined, and you click on it, it takes you to another web page or another website altogether. That's a hyperlink. That's what this is doing. Patterns in the Old Testament specifically are hyperlinks. So when you see it pop off the page at you, you know, oh, the author's trying to get me to think about that last story I read. Make sense? So we're going to learn to do that. Now, what you need to understand is Genesis chapters 1 through 11 specifically are loaded with these patterns. And it's... I, the way I think of Genesis 1 through 11 is like the introduction to the rest of the Bible because it's, it's dealing with a lot of people. It's kind of a zoomed out approach. God's creating everything, and then it kind of zooms into Adam and Eve, and then that kind of splinters off and gets bigger, and that story gets bigger, and the location gets bigger, and then it zooms back into Abraham. That's kind of how it works. If you think of a camera lens, you'll identify with this. Um, that, that's kind of what it's doing. It's zooming out and then zooming back in to an uh, individual. Um, but in Genesis 1 through 11, all of these patterns get introduced, and it's designed to teach you how to read the, re- the rest of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. I call it the Hebrew Bible. That's what it was written in. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's what we need to do. we got some preliminary stuff to talk about before we get into the creation story. Okay, anybody want to guess how many verses of Scripture we're going to cover tonight? You want to play, place a bet? We're not Baptists, we can bet. It's okay. <laughs> we're going to cover two verses. <laughs> I was going to cover all six days of creation, and I covered, I studied the first two verses, and I went, yep, we're not going to make it past that uh, and not get out of here before midnight. So, so here's what I want to do. I want to talk about some rules for reading the Bible. This is not just for the Old Testament. This is for the whole thing. Because we need to understand a few things. We need to admit some things to ourselves before we approach a biblical text. Because it's really old literature. And it was written in a different place, a different time, a different mindset. Okay? So here's some rules for reading. And I think I came up with these. But if you find them somewhere else on the internet, let me know. And I'll make sure I attribute it to whoever that is. But I, I, I just wrote this this week, and it's so clever. Look at it. Read. Rules for reading. Um, I won't even tell you how long it took me to make that work. Uh, <laughs> so here's what we need to do. When you're reading the Bible, you need to recognize your limitations. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible was not written directly to you, but it was written for you. There's a difference. 
The Bible was written to an original audience who read that language and understood that culture because they were in that culture and understood that language. So we're reading a book that's ancient and it's Eastern, and we are modern Westerners. So do you think maybe we could misunderstand it? Yes, because we're living in a whole different culture, multiple different things, and we're speaking a completely different language. Okay, especially in the Old Testament, is written in Hebrew, and Hebrew reads right to left. Do you think that's a little hard to read? It is. <laughs> okay, trust me, I'm trying to learn it right now, and it is very difficult to read the opposite direction. Um, so recognize your limitations. So there's going to require some hum humility there. Um, evaluate your presuppositions. That's, that's a big word, let, let me explain. Um, we think about presuppositions, think about assumptions. All of us, when we open this book, especially if you're raised in church, you have a whole set of things that you already believe. And you bring all of those to an ancient book, right? You, everybody in here does it, including me. It's impossible not to do it, okay? But it is possible to really make sure we understand that about ourselves, that i got to be careful not to bring something I already believe and impose it on what the author say. Does that make sense? Okay, that's important. You'll see in a minute why this is important. Um, so evaluate your presuppositions. Make sure you don't just come to the text assuming you already know what it's saying. Because especially in the Old Testament, you probably don't. <laughs> Okay, it's much more sophisticated than a surface level reading. Okay, the other thing we need to do is adopt the author's perspective. Okay, so remember, we're modern Westerners, they're ancient Easterners. So we need to try to get into their world and try to think like they think the best we can. Don't bring your perspective in. We're trying to figure out what was their perspective. Make sense? All right, and then last one develop some humility. Now, here's, that's a fancy way of saying, you can be wrong. <laughs> and me too, okay? Now, I spend my week studying to make sure I'm not wrong, but can I still be wrong? Yes. Okay, so, so if I'm studying all week and digging into Hebrew and ancient Near East culture, and I can still be wrong, then we can all definitely be wrong. Okay, even the scholars that I go and study and read behind, they can be wrong. And sometimes they'll have to reprint one of their books to say, you know, I really thought this way, but then we discovered this and that changed our thinking a little bit. So we had to correct the book that we wrote about it. So we were wrong. And here you go. That's humility. We need to be willing to do that, right? So if anybody's teaching the Bible and they're absolutely confident they've got it right and everybody else is wrong, be very careful with that Bible teacher. We want to admit when we don't have it all figured out. So I'm, going, I'm telling you that in the forefront. I'm working as hard as I can, but I could miss things, okay? And the Bible is a living book, right? The Word of God is living and active. What does that mean? It means you're going to discover something new for the rest of your life. It's just the way it is. It was designed that way. God designed it that way. Okay, um, let's get controversial. How's that sound? What is in my pocket? <laughs> I, <laughs> that looked planned, but it really wasn't. <laughs> I had that in my pocket because I had to get my tag read on it, uh, read whatever today, and I didn't know if they were going to make me have it on. Um, okay, so we're, we're going to dig into the creation story the next couple weeks, and obviously there's a lot of controversy around that, right? Okay, and it's not just about, is it creation or evolution? We know that controversy is out there. There's controversy within just the creation part. Even if you're not even talking about evolution, there's multiple views about all of this. And I might frustrate you because I refuse to pick a view. That's going to be frustrating. I already understand. It's frustrating for me. The reason why, with anything, if you talk talk about creation, you talk about things in the Old Testament, or if you fast forward to Revelation, there's a bunch of different views about Revelation, and which view do I pick? Revelation's view. 
I don't pick man-made views because they all have flaws in them, and I can you can find something wrong with all of them, okay? But there are a lot of debates about this. Um, so here's what we need to, to kind of talk about. So there's, there's various debates about this, and um, here's a few of them. The age of the earth, or the age of the universe. Now, how many of you were raised where you were taught that the earth is 6,000 years old? Anybody raised in that? I, I kind of was. It's about 6,000 years old, okay? And then sometimes that goes further and they say, and the whole universe is only 6,000 years old. So there's that debate about that. And then there's the debate as, well, is it six literal days that the earth was created or is it six long periods of time? There's that debate. Um, there's the, cre- did God actually speak and draw a human in the dirt or did he do it through a long process of evolution? There's that debate. Um, and the result of all this is there's a bunch of unnecessary division about this, okay? Um, and this is dangerous. Uh, if we stake our claim on only one view about creation and we teach only that one view to our children, we never tell them there's any other ideas about this. We just stick to that one view. Um, and then we teach them that our entire Bible and our entire faith crumbles if that one view was wrong. That's dangerous. Um, I, let me set up a scenario for you. For example, uh, and I'll just read what I've got here in the notes. Imagine a child is raised to believe that the Bible teaches that the universe cannot be more than 6,000 years old. Now, what happens to their faith when a college professor shows them convincing evidence to the contrary? Regardless of where you think that evidence is true or not, a college professor or whole set of professors shows them very convincing evidence that the universe is older than 6,000 years. What's that going to do to their view of the Bible? What's that going to cause them to question? They might start questioning Genesis, and then that might... Then they might think, well, well, if that's not the way I thought it was, then maybe the whole thing's not even true, and then they leave the faith altogether. Does that happen? Uh, about 80% of the time, students leave our churches, they go to college, they get told a different story, and they walk away from their faith. Now, what we like to do as Christians is we like to blame the universities for that. Well, if they wouldn't teaching all this ungodly evolution, no, 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 then my kid wouldn't have left the faith. And really that's a convenient way to point at someone else. What we ought to do as parents is teach our kids better. What we ought to do is make sure that they understand ahead of time there are different views about this. There are different views, and some of them are held by very godly people that don't agree with each other. But our whole Bible does not ride on one view of the age of the universe. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? So we need, we need to, and I'm not telling you to compromise. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is there's different views of this, and the text supports different views. And we just need to understand that, and we need to be mature about it. And we need to not raise our kids to be so narrow-minded that their faith comes crashing down because they got to college and found out there's people who believe different than me. That must mean my parents were wrong. That's kind of how it goes. So we just need to be better with that. We need to be better parents of teaching our children. I think we can all agree we could do better, okay? Okay, so how do we avoid this problem? And this is, this is really important. I promise I'm going to read the Bible in a minute, okay? I know that's why you came. We've got to pay attention to what the biblical author does and does not say. So when we get into the creation account, and you're like, okay, well, was it this or was it this? we got to be careful to pay attention to what the author is saying and what they're not saying. Because here's the truth. (laughs) Most of the debates about Genesis are centered around what the author's not even talking about. Does that make sense? You're going to see in a minute. We'll dig in. We'll argue about it. It'll be fun. Um, Most of the debates about this whole thing 
are about things the text is not even talking about. It mentions nothing about a universe. It, it just doesn't. And now it talks about stars and sun and moon, all that, but it's not talking about how old it is. So we're debating on this passage and dividing as believers and throwing rocks and judging unbelievers based on things that the author didn't even talk about. <laughs> Make sense? So I'll point that out as we go. Um, okay, so how about we get into Genesis chapter 1? Any questions so far? Nope. All right. Okay, um, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to bring up a passage where I can, like, draw on it. So we'll see if it works. Whoa, that's way too big. All right, we ready? Genesis chapter 1. Everybody see that okay? <clears throat> All right, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. So those are the two verses we're going to cover, and I want to, we're going to pick them apart and really focus on what the author is saying, okay? I'm going to sit down for a while or I won't be able to walk afterwards. <clears throat> Apparently at 37 years old, you can't stand up for an hour. I don't know what that's about, but we're working on it. Okay, so in the beginning, anything about uh, what date? Is, did, he, did he give us a date? Did he tell us how long ago it was? No? Hmm. Okay, so in Hebrew, uh, you're about to see why I type and don't write, okay? Um, okay, the, the word here is, the, the B sound is really short, so it's B or ba. And, and this one sounds funny. I'm just going to tell you that before I say it because you're going to laugh anyway. Reshit. <laughs> okay? So when somebody says, what do y'all study at Grace and Truth? Well, we learned a Hebrew cuss word. That was fun. Okay? So, Bereshit. All right? Now, this word gives no indication that the author knows when this happened. This word in the Hebrew language means way back when we don't know exactly, but way back when. We would say way back when. You use that phrase? Okay? Usually, it's an ambiguous phrase. It's like, I, I don't have a date and time for this, but it was, it was a long time ago, okay? That's what this word means. It does not mean anything else. It can't, okay? This word flat out means the author is saying, at some point, there was a beginning, okay? Now, what has modern science been telling us lately? At some point, there was a beginning, and in that beginning, nothing was there. Hmm. I just, I love it when science comes out with that. They're like, wow, look what we discovered. And it's like, we knew that. <laughs> we knew that. Um, okay, so in the beginning, we all, we're all clear on that. No indication. So when someone says, we know that the earth is only 6,000 years old, you can say, I don't think you know that. Why? Because the writer of Genesis in the first word, said he didn't know. We good? We good? Nobody's got pitchforks or torches, do they? Okay. All right. Uh, now, this is a pretty important word. Do you think this word's going to show up later in the story? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's what I want to teach you to do here. Um, let me erase that. When something that we know, because we've read the Bible before, is going to show up again later, what I do in my Bible is I draw a box around it. And that tells me, this is just my own system, that tells me that this is a pattern term. It's going to come up again, okay? So we're going to do that throughout the book. God's kind of obvious. He, he's kind of in every story, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, unless you go to, what is it, Ruth? Is it Ruth that God's not in the story, or is it Esther? 
We'll find out. Anyway, uh, okay, so God. Now, we need to take a minute here because there are some things that I, I just never was taught this until I started studying Hebrew in the Old Testament. Um, this word in Hebrew is Elohim. Can you see that? Elohim. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll make it capital since it's talking about the Creator. Uh, this word is not God's name. Okay? It's not. What is God's name? Yahweh. Yeah, Yahweh. Okay? So, <clears throat> but did he tell us that yet? No. He just said, in the beginning, Elohim. Now, this is a very interesting term, and I'll, I'll try not to get too nerdy about this, but uh, this is a plural word in Hebrew. <laughs> and I'll explain. The word Elohim, now in, in this verse, it's speaking of the creator Elohim. But the word Elohim is a Hebrew word that means spiritual being, not human. Okay? Now, why is that important? Well, because in a few weeks, we're eventually going to make it to chapter 6 of Genesis where there's this group called the sons of Elohim. B'nai Ha-Elohim in Hebrew. So who are they? <laughs> and then if you keep reading in the story, you'll notice this English word comes up a lot. Can you read that? I, I messed up my G there. Little G, gods. Have you read that in the Old Testament quite often? The Israelites keep going off and serving other gods, and God, Yahweh, commands them, do not go and serve other gods. The word there is Elohim. Why? Because it refers to spiritual beings, not humans, spiritual beings. God, Yahweh, is an Elohim. But he is the creator Elohim. So we're not saying there's multiple gods who are equal to each other. There's Yahweh, the creator, and he is an Elohim. He is spiritual. He's a spiritual being. Nothing controversial about that, right? Okay, that'll be more important later in the story. Okay, so Elohim, the creator Elohim, Yahweh, uh, created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Hebrew word here is bara. That's different when you keep reading down in the story and it says that God made something. Okay, that's asa. That's a different term, and we'll, we'll get there next week. Okay, so God created the heavens and the earth. Now, <clears throat> When you see heavens, what do you think of? Okay, heaven where God lives. Okay, yeah. Is that pretty much, is that what we all vote for? Everybody's so nervous. They're like, I don't know, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> Somebody said something else. Did anybody say something else? Okay, all right, good. Skies and land. That's what the Hebrew words mean. Okay? Now, when you, see, when you see this word earth, what do you think of? You think of a big ball that's got land and water and it's just suspended out in space, right? So when you think earth, that's what you think about. Was that what the writer of Genesis was thinking about? No? Why not? <laughs> See? Isn't this fun? I love this. It may not be fun for you, but I'm having a ball up here. Um, they had no concept of a globe. What we, when, if, you show, if you were to show an ancient Israelite a picture of earth from space, they would not have a clue what you were showing them. They had never seen that before. They had never been, there was no rockets. <laughs> they didn't go out and go, oh, that's what it looks like, and then come back down and write the Bible. That's not how it works. 
they did not they don't have the same picture in their mind that we do now what you want me to draw what they were thinking about this could be dangerous here um okay so let, let's imagine it if if you were writing genesis and god was god was inspiring you to write down the story that your ancestors had told you for centuries that's what we have here um and you walked outside, and you, how do I describe this? Okay, now let's imagine you, we've never seen a picture of Earth from space, all right? Imagine you're standing out in a field, and you're just looking up. What would, what would we, if we were to draw a picture, it would probably look like this. Okay, well, there's land, it's pretty flat. Now, some places there's mountains, that's a terrible mountain. That looks more like fire or something, but... You know, and there's trees. <laughs> there, that's what it is. Okay, and then up a, above us, you've got like clouds, right? And I know this is revolutionary, isn't it? Um, then you've got a. Uh, hey, watch this. And you've got a sun. Ooh, I'm so creative. All right, okay, and lands here. Now, what, what's up there above the, the clouds? What does that look like? Yeah, but what shape? Does it kind of look like this? Looks like a dome, doesn't it? Next week, we're going to find out that the writer used the word for dome. Because in his mind, when he looks up, that's what it looks like. Right? Is he wrong? No, he's just riding from the ground. He's not riding from space. He's never seen that image before, okay? Don't let this make you nervous. Now, in his mind, that sun, that big bright thing, it looks like it's right up there inside the dome, right? And then at night, that thing like goes into the sea or off the edge, and this other thing comes up. And it, and it also is kind of a light, right? So in their mind, that's what they're seeing. Now, what Genesis 1 is not, it's not a science book. Now, most of the debates, and I watch lots of them, okay, um, people get on <laughs> YouTube and TV and, and it's, uh, universities, and they'll, they'll literally spend two hours arguing over what the Bible's describing as scientific, and I'm the whole time I'm thinking, they're not scientists. <laughs> they're not doing science. Okay? Anybody nervous about this? It, it'll be okay, I promise. Okay, so we've got the skies, what's up there? And we've got the land, what's down here? Okay, so the Hebrew word here is eris, kind of pronounced eretz. Um, and that word does not mean globe, it means dry land. So the heavens, what's up there? And what's down here? Make sense? Okay, so you might do not do it this way. What's up there? What's down here? In the beginning, God created out of nothing. That's what this word means. He didn't have stuff to work with. He creates it out of nothing. And what did he make? Well, he made what's up there. God's space, and what's down here, and who's down here? Us, human space, God's space, our space. Remember the, the two circles, heaven and earth, right? Now, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. Hmm. Now, here's what, uh, any of you grew up with a uh, Schofield study Bible? You ever heard of a Schofield study Bible? It was real popular back in the day. And, it, and it's good for the most part, but on this verse, it's wrong, okay? It says there's a gap between these two verses. And there was a whole other world with a whole other creation, and something went wrong, and God started over in verse 2. And that's called the gap theory, okay? Now, all you need to know about that is this. 
There is no gap <laughs> between verse 1 and verse 2. How do we know that? How do we know there's no gap? Did he say there was a gap? No, that's a theory. That's why it's called a gap theory. Okay, it's not there. And in Hebrew, there's no indication there should be a gap there, all right? So God creates what's up there, what's down here. But what, how did that come about? Well, it started out without form and void. Now, these two Hebrew terms are fun to say. So you've got tohu, and that looks like wa, but it's va. Vohu, tohu va vohu. You want to say it? Go ahead. Tohu vavohu. Yeah. It, it, it rhymes on purpose. The author meant to do this. Um, and what these words mean, let me get my notes here and make sure I don't mess these up. Sometimes I get them backwards. Okay, so tohu means uh, mainly, it can mean shapeless, but really what we should be thinking here is it's without order. It, it's, it's a chaotic environment. In respect to human life, this would be chaotic. We wouldn't survive it. Make sense? Okay, so we've got tohu, without order, and we've got void, which just means empty. It's a wasteland. Okay, now can humans live there? No. <laughs> I thought uh, without order and empty would have been a good <laughs> indicator there. Um, no, this is not something humans can survive in, right? Okay, so it's presenting a problem. The author is wanting you to think, okay, he made the heavens and the earth, but there's an issue. It's without form, it's without order, and it's empty. Humans can't survive there. There's more to the story. That's, he's bringing you along. And what else? Well, there was darkness, okay? Well, do we want to live in darkness? No, right. Darkness was over the face of the deep. This refers to deep waters. Every time this word is used, it's about water. So we'll just draw some waters there. Okay? Now, then we've got spirit. Okay, so what do we have so far? Well, we have some heavens, and we have something called earth, but it doesn't have any form, and it's empty. Nothing's there. And there's a bunch of water, deep waters. Now, in the Israelite mind, deep water is a good thing or bad thing? Bad thing. Can humans live in deep water? No, bad thing. So the ancient Israelite, he doesn't like to go out on deep waters. Here's why. It's deep. And when storms hit deep water, what happens? You die. Okay? So in their mind, this is a dangerous place. It's tohu vavohu. It's dangerous. We're not going to be able to survive here. But there's another character on the scene here, the Spirit of God. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. You got a ch at the end of it, ruach. Spirit of God. Now, what's cool about this word, and, and, and this is true of a lot of Hebrew words, they're used to describe several different things. So this can mean wind, breath, or a life-giving force. Use the force. Yeah. Any Star Wars fans? Okay. It's not the same thing as the force. but Okay, so ruach, it can mean wind, breath, or, or life-giving force. So when you, uh, everybody hold your hand up in front of your face. Breathe out. Not too much because your breath probably stinks. That's your ruach. According to ancient Hebrew, that's your ruach. There's something in their mindset, that thing that goes in and out of you is keeping you alive. And we know that now scientifically as we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon, you know. So when we hear God speak, now is he going to speak in the next few verses? Do you, do you wonder if the Spirit might be involved in that, speaking? When we talk about God's Word being inspired by God, by His Spirit, think about God speaking. All right? 
Are y'all bored yet? <laughs> All right, in the Spirit of God, what was the Spirit of God doing? He's hovering over the surface of these deep, chaotic waters. Now, you want to hear something cool about this? Um, this refer, this this word here, rahap, it refers to um, back and forth. And later, it'll be referred to the motion of wings. Now, can I think of a story in the New Testament where the spirit is connected to some kind of animal with wings? A dove. What, where did that happen? At Jesus' baptism. Remember, he's baptized, he comes up, and they said they saw the spirit of God coming down like a dove. Meaning, it might not have been a literal dove they were seeing, but it just seemed, it looked like a dove descending on Jesus. And then the voice of the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay? So, now was the author thinking about that when he wrote this word? No. But was the Spirit of God thinking about that? Probably. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, he's hovering over the face of the waters. Now, okay. So, we've got in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. <clears throat> so here's some questions. Has the author given us any indication of time or the age of the earth or universe? No. Uh, is the author trying to solve the modern debate on the age of the universe? No. Then what's the author's point? Yeah, there's no indication of when, how long ago this was. Um, so does it do us any good to be arguing about that? No. Do, do, does it do us any good to argue with unbelievers or scientists or people who uh, believe in evolution or whatever? Does it do us any good to argue about that when the text does not say anything about it? No. So could it be that we're waging a war which we're losing, by the way, against the scientific community because we're trying to make the Bible say stuff it doesn't talk about. Like, I, I hear this all the time. I like to watch atheists on YouTube. I, it's just a, maybe it's a guilty pleasure of mine. I don't know. <laughs> but I like to hear their point of view. And a lot of the, what I call the new atheists, which is, um, if you want a list of them, there's Richard Dawkins. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. It was very popular. He spent a whole book disproving God and talking about how ridiculous the Bible is. And really funny, somebody interviewed him about his book and asked him had he read the entire Bible. And he said, no. I was like, you wrote a whole book disproving something you haven't read. Interesting. So that's Richard Dawkins. And then you've got Sam Harris. And he's still doing a lot of stuff lately. And um, he's an atheist. He thinks the Bible's ridiculous. And one of the things he brings up is... Well, science knows that the, that the universe is older than 6,000 years old and the Bible claims it's 6,000 years old. And I want to scream through my computer and be like, the Bible doesn't say that. Stop using that as your reason to say that the Bible's ridiculous. It never says that. Okay? So let's not, let's not get into that. The Bible's not saying that. Okay, so if that's... Not the point, if that's not what the author wants to argue with us about, then what is the author trying to say? It's very simple. He's saying, in the beginning, God. This story is about a who, not a when. That's the point of the author. That's what he's trying to do. That's what the Spirit of God is leading him to write about. In the beginning, God. And what did that God do? Well, he decided to, to create some stuff. He created what's up there, and apparently in that space is where he is. He's a spiritual being, so he's up there, and then he made this place down here. And it's going to go on to describe more things that he did with that without form and void. What he does is he takes that thing that's not in order and uninhabitable, and he puts it in order, 
and creates inhabitants to live there. So what is the author of Genesis trying to do? He's not trying to argue about science. He's not trying to argue about the age of anything. What he's doing is saying, hey, to everybody out there who will ever read this, there is a God and he made this place. It's really that simple. So when you go to work tomorrow or school or wherever it is you go, and you hear somebody start talking about the Bible being ridiculous because of the creation story, you have a tool now in your toolbox that you can pull out and say, hey, let's talk about that. Because if you actually read the Bible, it's not making any arguments about that. It's just trying to tell you who did it. Sound good? Okay, so we took some fights off the table. We got enough fights, don't we? <laughs> well, let's take that one off, right? I've got friends who don't believe the Bible, and that's some of their hang-up. And I love to sit down with them and go, hey, get, let's talk about that. Do you think the Bible is claiming that the earth is young? Is that, what, is that why you think it's ridiculous? And they're like, yeah. No, what, well, let's read it. Who, who knew that in talking about the Bible, you could actually sit down and read it? instead of arguing about it. So we sat down one day, me and this friend of mine, and I said, look, right here it says, in the beginning. And that word means we don't know how long ago. And he was like, oh. And then we read on through, and I said, it, it doesn't claim anything about how old the earth is. It just says there is an earth, which we know, <laughs> but that there's a creator. You got a problem with that? And this guy said, no, I don't. And guess what? Now we've got our foot in the door. Now we can have a conversation about who that God is. Because we don't have a barrier in front of us arguing about things the Bible doesn't talk about. Now you, you may be sitting here thinking, well, who cares about that? A bunch of people out there do. And there's a bunch of people out there that have trouble believing the Bible because of things Christians have told them about the Bible that aren't in the Bible. So how can we just maybe uh, stop it <laughs> and let's just talk about what it says? we got to understand the Bible on its terms, not on our terms, not on our theology and presuppositions and assumptions. we got to find out what do they want to tell us. Okay? Sound good? So that, that's the first two verses. So here, here's the author's point. The author's point is to tell us who created the universe, not exactly when, nor scientifically how God created it. It's about who. The author's focus is on who. All right? Now, so let me, let me set this up for you. If the, and I'm not saying it is, if the universe was proven to be 14 billion years old, not, not just the, earth, the universe, would that change anything the author has told us so far? No? Now, I'm not, I'm not making any claims about science. I'm not a scientist, okay? So, no. That wouldn't be, if you sat down with the author and said, the universe is 14 billion years old, man. Don't you know science has told us that? He'd be like, so? <laughs> yeah, I, w I wasn't talking about that. He, he would say, um, the first word I used was, I don't know how old. <laughs> right here. All right? So if, if science says it's that old, we don't have to believe them. We can believe them. We cannot believe them. That doesn't matter. When we're talking about the Bible, that's not the issue. That doesn't change anything about what this story is telling us. Everybody okay with that? Anybody want to argue with me about it? <laughs> right? So in the beginning, way back when, God. And then the story goes on to tell us what he did and goes on to tell us what his purpose in doing it is. Okay? Um, now, uh, if, now think about it this way. If God's existence or even the validity, validity of the Bible hangs on the age of the universe, don't you think God would have said something like, 
of Genesis verse 1, you better get the age right or I won't exist and you can't believe anything I say. <laughs> but that's essentially what some groups of Christians have been saying about Scripture. If you don't get this right, you can't believe anything else. If you don't, don't get this right, then how do we know if God's real? Well, that's a serious problem for me because the author is not concerned with getting ages right. He's concerned with telling us something about the God who made the world that we inhabit. Make sense? Okay. Any questions? I put this in the notes, but I'll say this, and I'll then I'll really stop talking. No one in the Bible, no one in the Bible, ever argued about the age of the universe. That should be a clue that they didn't care. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm too simplistic about this, but if I go looking in the Bible for what they thought was important, I don't find that debate anywhere. Why? What does that tell me? That nobody cared about that. <laughs> nobody was concerned. What were they concerned with? There's some heavens and there's an earth and there's a God who made it and he actually doesn't want to stay up there. He actually wants to be down here with us and he's got a purpose for us and he's got something good for us to do. That's what they're concerned with. Okay, so when we talk to our children about this, this is how we need to present it to them. We need to not be saying things the Bible's not talking about. And if your kids say, well, how old is the earth? What you should say is, number one, I'm not a scientist. Number two, I'm not sure anybody actually knows. Because I study science too. I'm reading a couple books by a couple of scientists and physicists. Um, and here's what, here's what I'll tell you about that. In the Christian world, we have all these views and we debate. Guess what's going on in the science world? The same thing. They don't all agree. And when they tell you what the age of something is, if you noticed it's a big range? Oh, we dug this up, and it's between 100,000 years old and 2 million years old. I always want to be like, oh, i got a question. That's a big range. <laughs> That's very far apart. <laughs> That's like saying yesterday or when Genesis was written. I mean, or it's even worse than that. So, there's there's different views about all these things, and we need to make sure our kids understand that. When you get to college, if you send your kids to college, and I'm not, I don't think everybody should do that, but if you send your kids to college, uh, to a public university, they're going to find out there's all kinds of different people that believe all kinds of different things. And if they're shocked by that, that's our fault. You can't blame the world for being the world but you can blame yourself for not being a good teacher of your children, okay? And you don't have to be a Hebrew expert to do this, all right? Just even in English, they got this one really, the translators often mess up, but they did really good here. Okay? Any questions before I give you some homework? Questions or discussion? Right. It's a rhetorical device. That's, yeah. Yeah, so when you, when you talk about what happens in the morning, you say the sun came up. Does, is that scientifically true? No, the sun, the sun didn't go anywhere. We went somewhere, and it made it look like the sun came up. But we describe it as the sun came up, Right? And then it went down. And it keeps coming up over there and keeps going down over there. You know, that's, how we, that's just how we describe things. That's not wrong. It's just the way that we describe it from our point of view. These authors are doing the same thing. We can't take things about the way we think about things and then force them to think that way or they must have been wrong. That's an immature way to read an, an ancient or a modern text. Okay. What else? Any any other questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a term that describes the nature of a being. So for us, we use the word human. Okay, you are a human, but I don't, I don't call you, I don't say, hey, human, right? So this word Elohim is describing the nature of what God is. He's spiritual. This is Yahweh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is Yahweh. You just don't you don't see the word Yahweh until you get to chapter two. He starts talking about the garden. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so Elohim is is a generic term for spiritual beings. Okay, so God is an Elohim, but there is no Elohim like Yahweh. You see what I'm saying? He's the supreme one, okay? So there are other spirit, we know there's other spiritual beings. We call them angels. Um, There are others in scripture you're going to see at the end of Genesis chapter 3, one called a cherubim. We call them a cherubim. That's not how you say it, but you can. Um, In Isaiah, you get seraphim. We're going to talk about that some. We get to Genesis 6 and all that. You got these sons of God, sons of Elohim. What are they? Well, they're Elohim, but they're not Yahweh. So we're going to get into all that, and that'll make more sense as we, we flesh it out. Everybody gets nervous about this because when we, when, we, uh, when we see this word, we assign all kinds of things to it. We assume that if you say the word God, that means that must be the creator without a beginning who creates everything is in control and supreme over everything. But in the ancient mind, their word, which we call God, Elohim, could mean any kind of spiritual being. But Yahweh is the creator and the supreme. And Yahweh created other Elohim. Some of them rebelled against him. Okay, we'll get to that later in the story. Does that make sense? Um, usually by, this gets really technical, uh, it's usually qualified by an indefinite article. Um, in English, it would be the word the. So it would be like the Elohim. So then, it's not this way every time. So this is a technical thing. But um, sometimes when you're reading through, if you're reading it in Hebrew, the way you would differentiate is Elohim is almost always a plural term in its by itself but it's modified by an article in front of it which will tell you whether we're thinking about the Elohim or we're thinking about other spiritual beings so it's indicated usually in the Hebrew text and that's that's why our English translations put a capital G on this one because there's no there's no article in front of it yeah Sometimes it's an article in front of the term Elohim. Sometimes it's a context around it that makes it clear. Sometimes it's a word after it that tells you this is, this is multiple beings, not just one. So in this context, it's referring to one Elohim, which we find out later is Yahweh. Our English Bibles, for the most part, do a good job with this. Um, sometimes, sometimes there's a textual issue that they don't get just right. But most of the time, they're getting this right. Now, some, sometimes you'll see um, in your English Bible, capital G and then lowercase od, that, that's Elohim, okay? And then sometimes you'll see it completely capitalized. That's the word Yahweh, okay? Other times you'll see it like this, all caps. That's Yahweh. If you see, if you see um, this, that's Adonai, which which means Lord, Master, Boss. But when it's in all caps in your English Bible, that's Yahweh. Okay, or if God is in all caps in the Hebrew text, they're they're translating Yahweh there. Because sometimes you'll see Lord Adonai, capital G O D. They're saying Lord Yahweh. So, our English Bibles do good with this. So, you don't have to be nervous 
about that. Now, they're, they're, there's a place in Deuteronomy where they took a variant reading and put the wrong one in, but we'll get to that in Genesis 6 um, and how it connects to something in Deuteronomy. We'll get to that later. Um, but for the most part, and I, I want to be clear about this, I like to tell you what the Hebrew says and what the Greek says and all that kind of stuff, but I don't want you to think you can't understand your Bible because you don't know how to find the Greek and Hebrew words. Our English trans our English translations are phenomenal. They're great. They're awesome. They do make mistakes, but they're often not deadly ones. Okay? They're minor things here and there. Okay? But for the most part, your English translation can be trusted. Please read it. You need to read it. And I'm, I can show you how to, by the way, the, the software that I use is called Logos Bible Software. Everybody that's in our Faith Life system, if you've got our app, you can download Logos Bible Software onto your phone, your iPad, or your computer. The computer version is much more robust where you can click on a word and it'll pop up and show you the Hebrew and all that stuff. Um, but it, even like on the iPad, um, you can do that. You can just highlight a word and it'll pop up and say, the Hebrew word is this. Here's some different meanings of that word. So everybody has access to that. And everybody has over $3,000 worth of resources in that app. You have a $3,000 Bible software package because you're in our faith life system. Okay? So I have a $30,000 package. <laughs> All right? But, um, but you, and, and you can go on there and buy more books or whatever if you want to. But. All right, any other questions about anything on here? Yes? So the question is, where did the idea that the earth or the universe is 6,000 years old come from? Okay, now there's a long answer to this, but I'll give you the short one because it's already 736, and I said we would be shorter, and look, we're not. Um, <laughs> so I should just quit making promises. Um, so the short answer is, really uh, good Christian godly people interpret the Bible a certain way, and, and what they do... Um, hard to make this short. Well, one of the ways they do it is they take the genealogies that are in the Bible where it's described and so-and-so lived this long and they had this son and that son lived this long and it goes on and on. They take that and they do the math backwards and they say, well, if you take it all the way back, then Adam lived around 6,000 years ago if you do the math backwards. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, Ancient genealogies don't work the same way modern ones do. They're, they're doing things very different. Ancient Hebrew culture, very different from ours. So we can't just assume that they're using numbers the same way that we do or they're using genealogies the same way we would. Um, so there's some problems with that view. Um, there's also, I better not get into that tonight. There, there's also some things in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2 that indicate there may be a difference in time there. We'll get to that when we get to Genesis chapter 2. But, but so if you, go, if you go to like a creation museum that a Christian group builds, uh, there's one in Kentucky that's down the road, well, it's a long way down the road, from the ark. You know the guy built a big life-size ark? Do you all know about this? It's a wonderful thing to go see. It's in Kentucky. It's in the middle of nowhere. Okay, but um, but we went to it, and uh, it's it's worth going just to see the size of this thing because they build it to the dimensions that are in Genesis. Um, so it's cool to go to, but they're in the six thousand year camp. That's and they stand on that. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible. So just be careful with that kind of thing as you're walking around the Ark encounter, or as some people call it, the Ark Park. <laughs> if you if you go to the Ark Park and you walk around, you see all these diagrams and all these things, and it's definitely advocating for a very young earth um, that is very hard to square with modern science. I'm not saying I buy everything modern science is saying, but I'm saying it. their viewpoints make us look bad is what I'll say to that. Um, so I don't mean that. That sounds really harsh. I love the people who made that. I like a lot of the things that they do. I think they take too hard of a stance 
on that one issue to which makes the Bible rise and fall on the age of the earth. And I think that's a bad way to read the Bible. So so that's kind of where it comes from. It comes from people who think about the Bible. It doesn't come from anywhere in the text. So good question, really good question. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, there's a lot of versions of the Bible, English versions. Um, is the ESV a better one, or why is it that I use it? Um, so, so I'll answer that. I want to do a whole podcast on that topic, because we've had that question several times, and that's an important question. How do we know which English version of the Bible we should be reading? Well, here's the thing. Um, I'm going to quote my Old Testament professor here on this. The best translation of the English Bible is the one you're going to read. Okay? That's a Hebrew scholar saying that. The one that you will read and be able to understand and will like reading it is the best one for you. But you shouldn't just pick one. Okay? Because there there are differences. Um, So I'll give you a quick run through, just very fast. Um, There's a a couple... uh, approaches to translating the Bible. You've got a thought-for-thought translation, which kind of follows the thought flow in the original language, and then there's a word-for-word translation, where they're taking the Hebrew word and translating it into an English word, and they're not following a thought flow, they're just word-for-word. Now, you might think, well, obviously, word-for-word's got to be the better one, but here's what you need to understand. The ESV is more on the word-for-word side, and I like it for, the, for partially for that reason. Um, the other reason I like the ESV is it, is it accounts for the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is something we'll talk about at length later, which are older manuscripts of the Old Testament that helps us understand more of what the original writings were, were saying. So they incorporate all the manuscript data and evidence into their translation. So that's one reason why I like the ESV. But you need to know this. There is no such thing as an English word-for-word translation because I've, I'm learning to translate as I'm learning Hebrew and English. You cannot understand a word-for-word translation. You can't. The words are in the wrong order. It just, I'm telling you, will not make sense to you. Um, I, I was reading the other night uh, an interlinear New Testament where it's got uh, the Greek first, And then it's got it transliterated with English letters and then English words right underneath it. And Suzanne saw it. She's like, what are you reading? (laughs) And I said, I'm just working on Greek and translation, getting familiar with it. But if I read that passage, it was a very familiar passage in 1 John. And I read it, and it's like you could barely understand what it was saying because Greek and Hebrew doesn't follow the same grammatical rules that English does. So there's no such thing is a true word for word. Yeah. Yeah, if you learn another language, you'll see this, that it doesn't always follow the same rules that we're following in English, right? So so just keep that in mind. So I use the ESV because um, I, I think it's, a, it's closer to word for word, but still readable. Um, there's another one out there called the New American Standard Bible. It's even more word for word, but it's, it's a little harder to read. Um, the NIV is more toward the thought for thought side. And the NLT, the New Living Translation, is very much thought for thought. But they're still good. They're still good. Um, when they updated the NIV recently, I think it was in 2011, uh, when they updated the NIV, I started seeing things that made me nervous. So I moved away from it and went to the ESV. Nothing big, like they didn't say Jesus wasn't God or something like that. It just, uh, just some minor things that I was like, eh, I don't like the way they're heading with this. So I switched to the ESV, which I've always used. Um, I just like it a lot more now. So good, good question. Good question. Um, as we, when we, we get kind of through the Genesis stuff, we may have a night where we just talk about that. The translations, where did the Bible come from? How do we know it's accurate? That would be a good discussion to have too. So that's coming in the future. All right. um, Let me give you your homework. Don't you love homework? This will be fun though. 
I'm telling you, when we start learning to read the Bible the right way, you're going to actually enjoy reading it, okay? So let me uh, go back to my PowerPoint here. This is what we're going to talk about next week, okay? I'm going to show you how the days of creation correspond to each other, how an ancient Israelite would have read this account, okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to um, read Genesis 1, uh, this passage here, Genesis 1, 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, because the, the creation story actually ends in chapter 2, verse 3. Okay, so a lot of people think, well, the end of chapter 1, it's over. No, it actually goes into chapter 2. The numbers for the chapters and the verses were added thousands of years later, so there's no special thing about that. Um, so we're going to talk about that. So what I want you to do is read that passage, and I want you to make some notes, and this is in the app in case you forget your assignment. <laughs> um, how many times does the word God appear? Just count them, write it down. How many times does the phrase God said appear? That's important. Uh, how many times does the phrase God saw? God saw something. How many times does that appear? How many times does the phrase God blessed appear? So do you get what I'm getting at here? As you're reading through it, just pay attention to things that get repeated. Make a note of it and count how many times that they get repeated. Now, you might say, well, why does that matter? Well, because it mattered to the guy who wrote it. He's doing all of that on purpose, okay? The way the Hebrew writers write is brilliant. It's very sophisticated, okay? This is not dumb, primitive people writing text. These are very sophisticated writers. So um, all that's important. So you'll, you'll see when you start counting these up, you're going to be like, hmm, God said, I'll give you one answer. God said appears 10 times. Is there anywhere else in the Bible where God speaks 10 things to someone? I don't know, maybe like a 10 commandments. Do you know that all of them are the 10 words? Word commandments, not there. It's the 10 things God said, the 10 words. So... Hmm, God, sp God said 10 times here. He's going to say 10 times somewhere else. Guess how many plagues came to Egypt? 10. Do you know what they start with? God said. This is what's going to happen. So, now you're thinking, well, that's kind of cool, but who cares? Well, you might care when you learn to read the Bible that way. <laughs> yeah. 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 So all this is important to Hebrew writers. The number seven is really important. And I'll try not to go too deep into all that because I can get really nerdy and I'm already boring enough. So, um, so write down any observations you see from that and bring it with you next week. And we're going to talk about what the author was trying to do here and what an ancient Israelite would have been noticing in the text. Don't go further than that. Just stop at chapter 2, verse 3. That's where the creation, that's where day 7 ends. And also, I want you, what I want you to do is make note of this. Evening and morning, first day. Evening, morning, second day. On through. But on the seventh day, there's no evening and morning. Just, just note that in your Bible, and we're going to talk about that. Do you think maybe the author's trying to say something? Have I got you interested enough to come back next time? <laughs> it's going to get, uh, we're, tonight was, um, we had to talk a lot about all the debates around this and all that stuff. We're, we're going to leave that behind. Uh, we, we solved that, okay? We don't need to debate that stuff. We're going to really dig into the text and, and learn from it, and we'll start moving faster. So just, just so you know, it's not like we're going to cover only two verses in an hour and a half every time, all right? And we had to kind of start slow, but we're going to pick up speed as we go, um, especially because you're going to learn how to read your Bible, that this is going to become really familiar to you, and I won't have to explain so much every time we sit down, okay? Sound good? All right. Well, I'm going to pray.
And if you got any more questions, I'll be glad to stay and hang out with you. All right? Thank you.